This is the Spokane Soccer Show, and I am your Super League-saturated host, Benji Wade. On today's show, my conversation with Zephyr FC head coach Joe Johnson. This was really tough to schedule. We literally found the only tiny sliver in our calendars where this could work, and it was on a Sunday afternoon. So for that reason, among many others, thank you, Coach Johnson, the team is in Seattle this week for their preseason, and I didn't need more reasons to be excited about watching this team play for the first time, but on August 17th, I might add. But like whether it was her perspectives and thoughts on soccer, her ideas about life, quite frankly, her points of view within the women's game, I was ready to run through a brick wall for this person and for this team. Uh, Coach Johnson is thoughtful, genuine, and as my friend Abby Carcio might say, wicked smart. So that's it. That's my introduction. Next up on the Super League Soccer Show takeover will be my profiles of all of Zephyr FC's players signed so far with my friend Abby Carcio. We actually didn't get to their most recent signing, the lone player from Seattle Rain, but that's coming. We'll 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 make up for lost time on that. It was like the Ocean's 11 meme. Do you think we need one more? I think we need one more. Rain FC just loaned a player to Zephyr FC. It was announced yesterday on Instagram. Uh her name is Mackenzie Weinert. She's a forward. I think this is to make up for the injury to Alyssa Walker who will be out for the next year. So, we didn't get a chance to get to Mackenzie, but we will in a future episode, but just wanted to make that quick note. That will be a two-part podcast. I'm looking forward to releasing that. It'll probably happen this week. But until then, and without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Zephyr FC head coach, Joe Johnson. Welcome to the Spokane Soccer Show, Coach Joe Johnson. Let's go. I've been waiting for this day. This is amazing. Yeah, I, I yes. get always a little bit starstruck when I'm doing these conversations, <laughs> so you'll have to forgive me. Okay, yeah. You and I have not even had so much as like, like a passing conversation I know. yet. Yeah. I feel like I know you from just the podcasts and the Instagrams and everything. So Are really you cool. following the vibes yeah, and the, the grams, the as, yeah. they, as the young people yep. say? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to, at least. Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. But welcome to the Spokane Thank Soccer you. Show. Thank this you. is awesome. You just told me where you're out in Nine Mile, so I, yes. I saw some uh, fauna in your yard. Yeah, on I felt Instagram. like a Disney movie last night. I go out there; it was like the first night at my new place, and there's a fawn coming out. The dogs in the yard. There's birds chirping, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing." Totally. Wait, yeah. what's that uh, Disney movie called? The one Bambi? No, <laughs> I saw the baby deer. There's so that one too. That. But Enchanted is that what it was called? Maybe. Amy Adams, maybe. Yes. Where she like yes. she plays she, this uh, ah yeah. character that yeah has Don't all. Don't make me sing, but yes, yeah, so <laughs> my daughter would. Yeah, she's all into Disney movies, so I have to keep up. But I yes. totally understand that. No, yeah. it's really cool. I've enjoyed just being a little bit further out. We just dis not too disconnected, but and disconnect a little bit and breathe. And can't wait for the family to get up here and enjoy that space too. Wait, who's up here so far? Just, just you? me, me oh. and the dog. Yeah. I got my okay. daughter, Emma, Jack, and then my husband, Jordan, they're coming up um, August 13th. So they'll be here that first game week. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Thank yeah. So goodness. It's all coming together. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. Kind of enjoy being around downtown, walking everywhere, going to eat. There's a lot of cool places to explore, but I'm excited for them to get here. So you haven't even moved into your, your new place yet? No, just... I did yesterday. Okay. That was my first day. So, so my new. first day, there's a deer in the yard, hummingbirds. I have a quail family that runs through. And so I was like, wow, this is pretty. Oh, Washington. That... This is very Washington, I thought. It is. And that area, <laughs> yeah. is, that area is like super, super yeah. pretty. Yeah. And then the weather this morning, the light drizzle for training, nice cloud cover. So I was like, this is. Yeah. Yeah. Not the 105 what... degree weather. Yeah. What a great introduction. Yeah. It was good. I assume, not because I'm just yeah. following the timeline, a lot of these players, some of them you might have known were there when you got hired yeah. and some of them are, have been announced after you were hired. Like, yeah. what has that been like? Uh, basically what you just explained. <laughs> so when I took a, like took the job, there was already players that were signed. And so it was get into film, years of film, different things to try to get to learn who they are. Got on calls, tried to reach out just to build that relationship because I wasn't in market yet. Some were flying in, some were here, yeah. some were signed. We're still waiting on some with visas. And so... There's lots of moving parts, but um, definitely try to dive in and kind of do what you do. Just find the background, playing styles, where they're coming from, where they've been, who they are as people um, first. And so it was that and then kind of jump start. And then now we're bringing other players into market, signing more people, getting some loans. And so it's kind of been both where you're like 
merging onto a highway and then now I'm letting some people in and so I'm trying oh, to kind of learn yeah. all of that but um yeah it's been good it's, it was a different challenge than what I was used to but it's good um Josh McAllister did a great job with um lining up what how we want to play with the players that he had you know that they already had brought in and so now we're just kind of adding some pieces to that and so I'm excited to to get out there and show everybody what we've got that has been a big part of the conversation for the supporters and yeah. the the front office and the way that the the club talks about itself in terms of it's not just one club it's both clubs right. and the way that I've interpreted events so far is that there will be probably an identity that that probably like is umbrella over top of both teams it yeah. won't be just oh velocity will play this way and you know Zephyr will play a completely different <laughs> way they're gonna they're gonna park the bus or right. they're gonna play gig and press they're gonna do whatever yeah, like. Yeah. Is that is that an accurate assumption? Um, that... I would say definitely like the values of the club are okay. all the same. Um, there might be nuances within the game model that are different, but I think both teams like want to play, want to play a certain style. I think you saw in the men, they change a couple formations, play a little bit higher of a back line. That's kind of like what we do, sit in the mid block mm -hmm. um, a little bit. So that, yes, it invites space behind, but that, with that aggressive possession and being able to keep the ball higher up the field. Um, and so, yeah, I think definitely with the core values and the vision and what we're trying to do from the top down, the club is both umbrella. Mm. There'll be different stuff. I mean, with injuries, with bringing people on, yeah. there might be different formations or different things. But um, and then even just frameworks of how we um, I know it's simple, but templates and how you structure training and that stuff is definitely aligned. And so obviously the details within your training mm. sessions may be different, but just like the schedules and all that is aligned. So that helps because the last he's actually had, you know, a head start. And so we've been able to pick their brains and Lee's been great. Um, to just figure out, hey, what worked? What didn't work? What'd you see? And so that's been nice that they've kind of got a jump start um, because they were an expansion club. We're doing the same thing as mm -hmm. um, can pick their brains on what, you know, use their experiences. So it's been, he's been awesome. You mentioned something a moment ago that it yeah. just kind of occurred to me. It's like, I can kind of assume now you were doing the same thing I was doing when it came to researching some of these players. Because yeah. <laughs> one conversation point that has come up with um, both Sydney and Abby and I, and then previous um, conversations that I've had in the podcast is just the world is catching up when it comes to the women's game right. and how popular it is, yep. especially from the like people who actually know what they're looking at yeah. and can appreciate that the women's game is, it's to me, it's, I, I, I look at it as not even being on the same level. I actually <laughs> like the women's game more. Nonetheless, the data, the analytics, the yes. the tape, the film, like mm -hmm. me and Abby really struggled to find data and to find like there was no equivalent to like transfer market and other of these different websites for yeah. even professional women's players. So has that been something that you've encountered? Yeah, you definitely. Um, we use Scout a lot or I did just to oh, look okay. because it's a platform across all of it. And so when you do have access, but it's definitely not probably the same. I don't, I'm not sure about transfer market. I'm not familiar with that one as much. Well, those but... are public websites. And oh, okay. Yeah. So it's funny. So I a, <laughs> yeah. I have a line out to, to Josh and maybe I'll okay. pick your brains about it too. Like, I think I need to get a subscription to Wisecout. Yeah. Cause I was going to say it opens up. So you basically game film at where they are, but it depends on what countries share. There's yeah. definitely different, um, okay. the United States is very good about putting film out and having a, a platform to exchange. And so once you put that in there, you can Dude, I mean, I can pull up a player and show all her off ball movements and I can mm. pull up and I can filter out what I want to see. And so you can see, okay, good moments, bad moments, 1v1s, aerial duels, and then you can just, and it just clips it all for you. So it was just geeking out. Honestly, I do that yeah. a lot, even when it, even with the World Cup. I mean, I like watching it, but when you get into Y Scout and you can get the tactical view and you can just kind of run through their pressing moments, run through. You can see that? Yeah. So right after, 24 hours after. <laughs> So I was like pulling up, you know, all of the games that you wanted to see tactical. There's not much commentary. And then you can just kind of dive into and keep up with the global game. I think that's huge. Yeah. Um, not just for, you know, as a fan, but I think just development of players and making sure that we're the standard. There's different um, even online that you might like that, too. But there's technical yeah. and tactical analysis of the Euros and the World Cups. And so they can do they'll just break down. Hey, we've noticed this formation is starting to come mm -hmm. become more popular. There's more goals in this area. People are building more in this. And so you can kind of get and stay in line with the global trends. And so that's kind of something I like to, especially after big tournaments, so they'll pull all that data together. But yeah, analytics, okay. science, 
like you were saying, the difference in the men's and women's game, not to go into it, but you know there's what? just Let's certain just do it. Let's talk about <laughs> it. There's just certain on. things that, like one pass that they'd be able to make, we have to do in two. And so you just have a little bit more breaking down, I think, and just so covering space is a little bit different. But I just think that you have to break down or use the ball a little bit more to break down defenses. You sure. can't just like smash it or we can't maybe knock a hundred yard diagonal ball, but yeah. um, we can do that in two passes. So how do we get that? opportunity to create that killer pass and so the intricacy that you're describing yeah. <laughs> though see that's like the good stuff yeah. to me i mean i think a lot of soccer heads kind of feel this way yeah. um i had uh coach chris watkins who was the former coach now former coach of the gonzaga women's yeah. team on the podcast mm -hmm. once upon a time and this came up in this way for him he said that basically from a mentality perspective men's players tend to play for themselves a bit more. There's more of a tendency to be selfish yeah. and that women players tend to play for one another and that they are constantly thinking about their teammates and not just not just on the pitch, but actually after the game, more so than men. Yeah. Do you think that that's a, a fair generalization about the, 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 the men's and women's game? Yeah, I mean, I hate to, you know, I've never coached on the men's side aside from, you know, working camps or different things. So I don't want to put... You know, that words. makes two of us, Joe. I've, yeah. coached, I've coached neither men <laughs> yeah. nor women. I want to make that clear. Yeah, so I don't want to say that. But I do like just the difference. I know that like a lot of the times females do, they care about each other, not only on the field, but off the field, take care of each other. You've got kind of mama bears of the locker rooms that make sure everyone's taken care of. And just um, we thrive when we know that we're in a space that we feel safe and mm -hmm. accepted and as a collective. And so that's um, it's a little bit harder to like bounce around clubs and I think for females, especially on the professional level, if you just keep jumping around loaning, it's a little bit harder than mm. instead of building those relationships and getting that family. Because I feel like when you're in that, that's when you just will run through a wall for anything. So I think, again, I have never experienced the men's mm. side, but I feel like it's easier for them just, hey, you're good. Come on, play. Um, there's a little bit more dynamics with locker rooms and stuff with females of when they feel accepted, when it's a unity, when it's, you know, say if we're going to go, then it's like, mm -hmm. you know, sky's the limit. So. I don't know if that no, <laughs> helps I, it all, but yeah, awesome. there's definitely different motivations and things that you need to make sure um, culture, locker rooms, you have a good leadership and all that stuff to make sure that they do feel that way so that they can perform on the field. Let's go back in time for a yeah. moment because yeah. I realize we're talking extremely <laughs> yeah. current day right <laughs> Sorry, now. Yes. And I want to hear about your soccer journey. Okay, like, yeah. where did your soccer journey begin? Uh, so my mom put me in gymnastics and I hated it and my brother hated soccer. And so he stepped out of his team and I joined the boys team and I just played like rec boys for a couple of years and decided I love this. And so I got into competitive, played all sports, but it was just the one I loved the most. And this so, is in Arizona? Arizona, yes. Okay. In Phoenix, in Phoenix, Arizona. Area? Yep. Okay. That was before ECNL and GA and all the acronyms. It was just one in state and then you had regionals and nationals. And so it was a little bit different. Um, the landscape of club soccer that was pretty regional. You stayed in your state. You maybe went to a tournament to LA or San Diego, went to one in Dallas, but now everyone's traveling all over the nation, which is crazy. It's cool because it's a testament to the yeah. growth of soccer. Um, but, but sometimes it's, also, it's a little complicated. It's also I'm problematic, like, yeah. Yeah, like you made this very complicated. And we expensive don't need, as hell. Yes, yeah. yes, because 12 year olds don't need to travel across the nation. They can get the same. Anyways, again, that's another podcast topic. Um, I hope we do that one because yeah. <laughs> I, I care about this a lot. It's yes. awesome. That ECNL stuff didn't exist when I was a kid either. No. And I just don't, I don't understand yeah. half of it. So, so played in high school, um, then went to, I went to junior college for the first year, stayed close to home, and then went on and played at UTEP, University of mm -hmm. Texas, El Paso. And then I got hired on right when I was done playing. I actually thought I was in trouble because the coach called me in and I actually got offered a different job. So I was going to take that and I... Long story short, I got called into his office during winter break, and I was like, oh, no, what did I do? I know I didn't do anything, but, you know, in narratives, you go straight to yeah, of course. principals calling you, yeah. and then he offered me a job to be assistant coach, and so I knew that's what I wanted to do. I was in the business with the education minor because I wanted to teach. I knew I wanted to coach. I loved the game. It had taught me so much growing up, um, just lessons, life, mm -hmm. teamwork, perseverance, all the things, um, so I just knew I wanted to get back, and I knew coaching was the way to do that, and so when he offered me a job, I said yes, and I coached there for three two, three seasons. Now I got as an assistant at UTEP. Yes. Okay. And then my husband is a collegiate strength coach, and he worked at Texas Tech, Arkansas, Ole Miss, UTEP, where we met. So then we got married, and then he got a job offer at the University of Tulsa, 
And so my mom lived there. We wanted to start having kids. And so we ended up moving to Tulsa. And then I took a year. Wait, was it just a synchronicity thing that your mom also lived in Yeah, Tulsa? it was kind of a weird. Yeah, okay. so we're like, it had to be. So <laughs> <laughs> so I moved there. And then um, as my kids got older, it wasn't as acceptable, I guess you could say, having just being a mom and a coach. And now I love it because barriers have been breaking down. You you see women coaches recruiting with their children with them or flying mm. with them or traveling with them. We've even seen with the um, national team with getting paid leave. Yeah. And there's just so many things that weren't available when I was first coaching. So I stepped out of the game and then I got back into club. I did ECNL, GA, coached in high school, coached semi-pro in the summers. And then I was like, okay, I want to get back into college. My kids are older. My mom lived there in Tulsa. So I started coaching at the University of Tulsa. And then all through that, I was just knocking out my U.S. soccer licensing, trying to learn as much as I can, um, going out, observing, just, you know, what growing. Length of, what length of time are we talking from when you were an assistant 2012 with 2012 is when I left and moved to Tulsa. Okay. And then that would have been, is that 12 years, 24 now that yeah, I'm here? Yeah. So mm -hmm. within that 12 years, I got my master's in sports administration. So I was just kind of trying to refine me and making sure that I was um, the best I could be where I was. And then as I did that, just doors kept opening up. And so I just kept taking them and growing. And then this one opened up and now I'm here, so. <laughs> okay, I have to ask, yeah. what kind of player were you? What did you play? What center your... mid. We didn't center have numbers. Okay. And it was a traditional like four four two flat midfield. Okay. And so I was one. And then that was when everyone started playing four three three, And that was a big deal when you had okay. the three in the middle. Yeah. And so we were always numbers down in the middle. So but I was definitely a six, eight, more of a defending midfielder. I did go up like a lot. Um, set piece. I was a I was a target on set pieces, so I had some goals there. But okay. defensive center made a play a little bit center You like back. to crash the box, Joe yeah, Johnson? Yeah, okay. I was box to box. I like oh. to both. Yeah, box our, to our box. <laughs> listeners are familiar with box, box to box. box. That's okay. come up. Yeah. I got asked that by, I think you have met Eliza Billingham yeah. from Inlander. She interviewed me, Okay, kind of funny. That's cool. And she did this thing where she asked me a bunch of vocabulary questions, yeah. and that was one of them. Box she explained to box. what box to box meant. Yeah. We have a box to box midfielder right here. I was, right I was here. a box to box midfielder, okay. which is probably like, like we like to keep the ball because I like when they passed to me and didn't just knock it over me. So that okay. might be subconsciously why we like to possess. Did you play any other sports? Uh, I played softball and okay. basketball and ran track. And you tried gymnastics and hated I it? I did. I did not like it. I don't really like individual sports. Yeah. That's the same with um, me. I don't know why. The because, spotlight. Yeah. I'm My like, goodness. If I had a bad day, I had 10 other teammates that could help me look better. Yeah. Or if they were having a bad day, I had their back. But on individuals, it was like, all or nothing. And My youngest daughter just went the other direction. Yeah. She's kind of done with soccer for a minute yeah. and she's going to do gymnastics only because okay. she wanted to do so much more of it. And we're like, you don't have time for this yeah. girl. Like, congratulations. You want to do team and all these yeah. other things. Well, there's the. You, well, you, and that was before yeah. all the specialization. That's it. Too, I was so. just going to say. <laughs> I got to do it all because we weren't 12 months out of the year <sighs> with all these. All you need is a ball on the wall. You don't need somebody getting paid $60 an hour to tell you what to do, but. It's all Again, professionalized. Yep. <laughs> you you kind of have to choose. Yeah. And I think it is to the detriment of everyone involved. Yeah. Especially the athletes. Yes, because the kids. the kids, they don't they're they don't enjoy it as much. Yeah. Just read this great book, The Empowered Athlete. Okay. I'll send you a link to it if yeah. you haven't read it. No, I love books. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, love I actually stumbled into Russ Davis, who's one of the co-founders of 90 Plus. Okay. Yeah. That's where my kid played. Yeah. So that's how I know Russ. And um he was reading the book. Right before I was getting ready to travel to Portland to yeah, go so to a, you yeah, said, yeah, get that book. <laughs> I downloaded it before I jumped on the there plane, and I just like, yeah, plowed through it, and it's fantastic. And, and the woman who wrote it um, talks quite specifically about the kids are leaving sports. Yeah, like seventy percent of kids by age thirteen or something like that are not continuing on with sports, which is yeah. like a it's like yeah. this is the the worst it's ever been for that yeah. because they're burnt out. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, well, I talked fun. about that. No, it's not. It it, it ruins everything. Yeah. Well, um, and uh, sorry, I know, but no go. Like yeah. even just working through the youth level and those platforms, asking a player, "Hey, you need to work on your left foot." They don't know how to do that on their own if it's not structured, and so that's like a little bit like, "Wow, things are really changing." Where it was get a rebounder, get you know, I guess you you have YouTube, you have all these different things that you could probably find something. But if someone's not like telling them or holding them accountable to those, it's 
It's creating so like it's, a, a learned helplessness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So whereas when we were kids and yeah, you just gotta go back figure it my, out. Back yeah. in my day. <laughs> yeah, totally. I just had to figure it out. After I trudged through snow and mud. Yeah, you both know, ways uphill you go. Right, no yeah. shoes. No I then would, <laughs> I used my garage door yeah. as my rebound. Yeah. I have a broad question. Take this any direction you want. What has soccer meant to you? Oh my gosh, everything. Honestly, it's given me like all the relationships, my husband, my best friends, all of the life lessons, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. They were just family. I mean, I had some adversity growing up and I always knew I could count on soccer. It was an escape. It was family. It was home. It gave me so much. And so I think that's, you know, that saying you never work a day in your life if you find something you love. And this is absolutely what I was meant to do as coach and walk through life with players and teach them the lessons that it taught me, but they still teach me things that I'm learning. And so it's just this constant cycle and um, it's just respect for the game and giving back to it. Cause I mean, every lesson, perseverance, hard work, teamwork, just love serving other people. I mean, you can find it all within the game. And so um, it's just meant everything, honestly. I know that's such a cheesy answer, no, it's but not. it's just- That saying that yeah. you'll never work a day in your life once you find the thing you love to do, it's yeah. a platitude, but it's a platitude because it's true. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. for a yeah. reason. Yeah. So when you hit the grind, you don't have a day off, or, but you don't feel that, or when you have to do expense reports that aren't so fun, but it's because it's for getting snacks for the players who are gonna go out there. I mean, it's just all, it makes everything better. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's definitely my calling. <laughs> So do you agree or disagree with the statement, football is life? Yo, 100%. I said that the other day. I was going to practice. Football is life. Are yes. you a Ted Lasso fan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mostly because it's helped my family be soccer fans. Oh, it, it, was, yeah. their, it was their gateway into Yeah, it? they okay. always were drugged to my games or whatever. And so it was kind of my thing. And so now they think that they're these big soccer people just because they know Ted Lasso. <laughs> I'm going to take it, at least I can get, but yeah, they, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it helped a lot with my relationship with my wife. I mean, I think one of the things I always think about with Ted Lasso is just when it came out, it was during the pandemic yeah. and it was when it was such a, it was not a cynical show, yeah, which is fun. like hard to find anymore. Mm-hmm. And I loved that about it, yeah. but yeah, big, big Ted Lasso fan. Yes. Um, I've learned a little bit about how you went from Joe Johnson player to coach Joe Johnson. Yep. Tell me um, about What are some of your non-negotiables as a coach? Principles, beliefs, whatever. Have to take that however you want. Um, So first, I think it's just everyone, no matter what position, we both do our roles on both sides of the ball. So our forwards are going to defend and our backs are going to attack and we're going to do it as a unit. So it's not, hey, I got beat and I'm going to go let the back line deal with my problem. It's, no, you're pressing from behind, you're doubling, you're doing whatever and Um, hopefully you see that in the way that we play is that everyone's defending, everyone's attacking, everyone's transitioning, and we're all doing that as a unit. There's not, you're too good for this. You're not, you know, there's no one's ever too big to do the small things. And so, um, I think that definitely is one. And then just competing and working hard through everything. If it's sliding to protect the ball from going out the back line to give us another opportunity. But, um, when we're on, we're playing, it's going to be intense. It's going to be competitive. Everyone's giving their all. We'll have time to have fun. But when it's time to work, we're going to work. And I think that goes back to that respect of the game is it's given us all this platform. It's given us so much that we need to do and give our best in every moment to not only give back to the game, but to also set. I mean, look at this opportunity we get to play. Like I didn't have this opportunity as a player when I was done playing college to play professional. And so we're going to respect that we step on the field is this is not only a cool opportunity for them, but they're also building something um, for future and for future players. Um, and so we're going to not take that lightly. And so attacking that aggressive possession, that's key. If you don't want to keep the ball, then probably there are moments that we're going to go behind if that's what's going, but, um, we're not just going to smash it and run. We're going to use the ball to break down defenses, unorganize them, and then exploit that space quickly. I think both sides of the ball there, everyone's attacking, everyone's defending. We're gonna have that aggressive position possession we're going to attack we're going to win the ball out of the field and we're going to work okay yeah yeah i mean i think you just did some vocab for yeah, our sorry. listeners no no <laughs> yeah. no no it's fantastic yeah. one of the topics that's come up before and another eliza billingham okay. question for me yes. was uh, what's total football and i think you yeah. kind of just defined yes. it yeah. this is the a dutch paradigm that yes. was started in the 70s but it's a total commitment to every yeah. phase of play. Yep. And everybody, and everybody has, has to do a role. Everything. Yep. Yeah. And they all have their jobs. And if you're not doing your jobs, we're going to find somebody who will do the job. So <laughs> yeah. I have to do all my roles. I can't just say, oh, I don't like doing that. So they're going to have to do the same thing. 
You also introduced at the end there, you teased it a concept yeah. I will bring up later <laughs> okay. in, in a, with these questions about direct play. But yeah. from where do you find in your coaching and when even when you were as a player, like your, your inspiration for both? Like if you look to other examples of coaches and mentors that you've had or professionals that you've watched on television or... Yeah, I think I was probably the only 12-year-old girl that watched Fox soccer because it was okay. like the first thing. And so I was watching a lot of, like, honestly, it was on and it was all the different leagues and anything. Now they have Fox Soccer Plus, but it was just constantly just absorbing the game. And so it didn't matter if it was Asian leagues or yeah. English Premier Leagues or it was just watching it. And then I think being that midfielder, I had appreciation for both sides of the ball. So it wasn't oh, we just want to score and who cares if we let it up because I had to do both responsibilities. So I think that made it, and it helps me as a coach know both sides of that, like in the attacking third versus defending third because I had to float between. I played pretty much everywhere in the middle, and so it was nice to have that experience as a player to then be able to teach. Um, I think right now I really like the way Spain and Japan play. Just oh, with my the goodness. Way. So if I can merge them together, I would say that's pretty much the style we like to play. Um, okay. I would say Spain's probably more athletic, and so that should fit our style a little bit more. But just the discipline, the spacing, the angles, the ball movement of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, but they just sometimes can lack some of the athleticism. And so if we kind of bridge those together, that would hopefully be... Zephyr football. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, and then um, I'm eager to see, I've really liked watching um, Chelsea and Emma Hayes, and so I'm eager to see what we, she does as she's kind of taking on the national team and then putting her spin on it within that short window before the Olympics. So it's been really cool to see, but um, they've been definitely fun to watch on both sides of the ball at Chelsea too, so... Did you did you get to watch the get to watch the quarterfinal with Japan? A little USA? bit because yeah. we were in the yeah. If you could combine Spain and Japan, my goodness, yeah. that's a well, that's, obviously that's a yeah. no. I get it, yeah. but you have to have aspirational goals, yeah, right? It's like yes. let's set and the so, bar right here. Yeah, let's just but go even for Brazil, it. it's kind of cool to see, what, huh? especially in these tournaments. It's cool to see. Okay, this they kind of press like we do. While well, they're going against the back three, how do they set that up? And then you can kind of put tools in your toolbox and to see, okay, and that's where that Y scout comes in because you mm. get to really break down that tactical side of stuff is, ooh, she went early, that opened this up. Oh, the center backs are pinching in. So what does that do? And so it's kind of cool. These tournaments are really fun to watch, um, how people adapt within their systems to other teams. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, watching Japan deploy like a 5-4-1, yeah, yeah. their level of organization yeah, was so, so incredible. Oh, yeah. The only thing they couldn't do, and this is why yeah, there were the right. Spain thing would have done them a lot of favors, just that little bit of class, yep. having a, a, a bon yes. mati or somebody yeah, like somebody that. Yeah, somebody that can threaten the back line. And, yeah. yes. The majority of the players yep. signed to Zephyr FC. Yes. So something me and Abby realized once we got through everybody, we're okay. like, this is a team that's pretty inexperienced as far as professionally, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of players that have like, you know, uh, 50 to 100 appearances even. This is a pretty young team and um, it's going to be your first foray into coaching professionally. Mm -hmm. How will that influence you all together? You know, will it be like one of those, hey, we're all new at this, let's go do this together type of thing? Yeah. What's, what do you think is going to be the I think that's already here? been it. Um, I think there's been enough experience that it's helped set the tone and expectations. Like we've had enough people in the pro environments to be held, hold each, themselves accountable and each other accountable. And so we haven't had to have like, that intrinsic motivation conversations. They bring mm -hmm. it, they work, they hold each other accountable. If it's not good enough, I mean, we'll tell them, but it's really cool because they'll say it. And so we have that leadership there, but there's also kind of a chip on the shoulder where some people feel like, hey, I can play at this level. I didn't get the opportunity. This is my mm -hmm. opportunity. And so it's kind of cool because now you have people that have something to prove. Um, I think that's kind of like what the whole club is, is hey, we're good enough. We're professional, we're division one. We're gonna go out there and prove what Spokane has. and the town and the, um, like I talked about, the resiliency and the competitiveness, and we're just going to go attack everything. And so um, that's really cool to see. And I think going back to what you said, it does feel like that. We're all in this together. We're learning together. We, I'm going to mess up. They're going to mess up. But as long as we keep that vision and that standard, um, it's all we can do. And so um, that's been really neat is that it wasn't Hey, someone new coming in, it's this is ours and it's new, and we get to define what that looks like in, over the next five, 10 years for the future. And so that's been really neat. And very, the whole group has been very intentional about what legacy we're leaving, being the inaugural season, being mm -hmm. the first in the league, 
um, and setting those standards. So it's a little bit of a mix of all of it, but I think it's just the perfect time for me to lean on them. They can lean on me and we're doing this together as a unit. And it's not just, um, it's a little bit more, I don't know, like a, like togetherness and the ethos and not just, you know, dictatorship, I guess. Yeah. Where it's, um, it's all of ours. And so it's really cool. That's awesome. And it's a brand, it's like you're, it's a brand new book that you're all writing together. Yeah. And it's like chapter one, paragraph one, sentence one is yes. starting with this group that's come together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that doesn't mean we won't have edits or different things along the way, but um, this group's been amazing and I wouldn't want any other group to go to battle with. You've already spoken this to this a little bit, but if there's anything that, that you wanted to add in okay. terms of the style of play, when you watch the sport, you mentioned when you were a kid watching yeah. I'm assuming like Fox Soccer Channel, Fox, which used to be called Fox Sports World. I've yep. referenced this before on my yes. podcast. Of <laughs> yeah. Whether you were 12 or even now, like what's the, what do you feel drawn to? Like what are some of the teams that you watch play? You mentioned the uh, Spain and yeah. Japan's national I teams. I love um, everything that's going on overseas. It's a little bit hard sometimes to get the games all yeah. the time. And so, even like I say, even watching on Y Scout later, um, I even mm -hmm. like watching... Uh, I know I just came from the collegiate environment, but always staying up with what's going on there and the yes. new styles and the different conferences. And it's funny how different conferences play different ways. And so, honestly, I just absorb it all because um, you can learn a little bit from everything and what everything's doing. But I think for Zephyr, um, just in the attack, it's that possession and retaining possession and using that as a way to move the ball forward, not just to keep it to keep it like – Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can win the possession battle and lose the game, but using that to draw players in to then set up that next pass. So it's like that chess match of if we build it here, somebody steps, now where are we going with it? And so that aggressive possession to use the ball to unorganize somebody to then to then break. If they're obviously playing a high line and the break is on, we can just hit that. But it's it's not a short or a long pass. I think Zidane said that. It's not short or long. It's the right one in that situation. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to that discipline and that collective is we all have to be on the same page um, solving that same problem as a group. And so that was like the first three, two, three weeks was getting everyone on that same page because everyone's coming in with different experiences. And so learning each other, the chemistry, how people play so that they can solve those problems together. Um, so on the possession side, defending side, we're trying to win the ball, have the field and press it. If not, we're in that mid block. I mean, it's just depending on what we're, our roles and responsibilities within the third but like I said, everyone's defending first goal is to regain the ball. So we're going to go win the ball. We're going to attack it. Um, and then transitions, if it's on to go forward, we go forward. If not, we keep it. So that's that decision-making. Again, going back to that collective decision-making as a unit. Mm -hmm. um, and then defending transition is to win the ball back and or reorganize. So, I mean, it's pretty simple within that. There's obviously yeah. lots of detail. Um, but when people watch it, I hope that they just see the collective problem-solving, that total football that you touched on. Um, that's not just about the individual. It's about what we can do as a group um, to solve on both sides of the ball. On a given Saturday or Sunday, yeah. if you found yourself watching the sport on television, like I'm getting a sense, but yeah. I'll ask you directly. What what leagues are you, would you oh, find Premier yourself League, in? Oh, Premier League, for sure. Saturday okay. morning. Um, I do watch NWSL. Okay. Uh, that's usually in the evening, and so you kind of stack it. also depends on if it's college football season and my husband has a remote, so then I'm <laughs> on the iPad, on the treadmill or something, trying to watch it. <laughs> but it just honestly depends on the time of day. And then you have um, the English women's football. I don't necessarily watch the Liga as much, mostly highlights. It's hard to find those yeah, games on TV. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a little to, bit harder. You have to go to weird in, places to yeah, find them. Yeah, there's different stuff. And, so, and then Champions League is cool because you get to see a little bit of everybody's out on the biggest stage. Um, Bundesliga, not as much because it's not as like visible on TV. So probably most of the... English Premier League on both sides of it and the Women's League. Yep. Um, and then NWC, league. yeah. So I'm trying to imagine your context okay. when you come upon this opportunity yes. with USL Spokane and Spokane Zephyr FC, right? Presumably you were at some point um, after last season with University of Tulsa and preparing for the spring schedule or yes. something. Yeah. And this opportunity to bring one of the things about this, the USL Super League, is that and you've already touched on this a bit, is these players that are like, I deserve a chance. I am I am worthy of the chance. I am good for it. Yes. And I'm going to show people. Yeah. It has presented so much of an opportunity for like nearly 300 players. By the yeah. time a couple teams come online and, and by 2026, there will be like 300 players in the USL Super League. Um, talk to me about where you were, <laughs> University of Tulsa, okay? 
and going, I'm, I'm going to go for that. Yeah, um, it's actually funny because I had players that were just done playing and there are, two of them are actually playing professionally now in Mexico and they were just done um, last year and it was just trying to help them find somewhere to play. Okay. And then I knew it was an issue, but we have these quality players within the United States that now have to go overseas. And so I was calling around, hey, I've heard this new Super League. I've heard rumblings and rumors and have some friends that are coaching within it and so picking their brains and then I was thinking well I want to be a part of that because it's the growth of the game and so kind of going at it from how do I get my players placed to wow I also want to be a part of helping grow this so that they don't have to go somewhere else and that there's another opportunity like you said we have 300 more players that can play and do what they love within the United States and we can continue to grow the game here I love the European model I hope it opens mm -hmm. doors for not only the NCAA and then the NWSL but shows the benefit of doing that model just for the health of the players, um, coaches, everybody. I think it's just amazing. So um, it was just kind of that. Was, and then just springboarded and then doors opened. And then I thought, well, this is all happening. And so it just felt right that I took that next step and met with Katie and Ryan and the organization. And they are brilliant. And I just couldn't say no after that. <laughs> Chatting with you for, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes so far, yeah. it comes as zero surprise to me <laughs> that you all hit it off. This yeah. is, and I'm so excited right yeah. now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to contain no, myself, good. Coach Joe Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me a little bit about what you just uh, alluded to, which is the European model. Yes. I saw Sydney answered that question a little bit, but I'd love my listeners who haven't had a chance to, to listen to that. Um, yeah. To understand what that what that means. Yeah. So just on the broad context, we have a season that'll go from August to December. And so it's one game a week. And so you're not trying to stack multiple games a week. So you have proper recovery, proper training time in between. Um, and it just gives you a little bit more instead of condensing it all into a short season, just the health, mental health, everything about. It, so you're not just trying to squeeze it in. So then you go on a break over the holidays, over the winter, they'll have time off. And then we'll have a little bit of a preseason. Then we have another season in the spring before the off season in the summer. And so it just elongates it. You kind of see it in the NCAA right now with fall season. And then mm -hmm. they have their exhibitions in the spring. But instead of making that fall season so condensed, playing Thursday, Sunday, extending that into the spring season. And then you see the NWSL is just one season that's very condensed instead of elongating it into a calendar year. Mm -hmm. So I think it just helps injuries. I mean, everything. When you put so much game load on the players, it starts to get, we just see it all over. Plus, international calendars, you can work around them. So there's just a lot of different things that you can, there's a little bit more flexibility. And then the health of the players, I think, is top priority. Uh, do you have a perspective about the draft? Um, I, I mean, I think it's fun. But taking the fun side out of it, I think it's good that the players have a voice on where they go. Um, especially when being traded and stuff that they don't have a voice. And so it's like they never have a voice if they're being drafted and they're being traded and being moved. They're almost just like a piece and a jersey and not a person. And so um, I like how the USL is basically you want to play here. And I think that gives ownership to it. And um, I'd rather people that want to be here than somebody that's forced to be here that may not want to. And so uh, I like the model of not having the draft, giving them a voice. And then if you're obviously putting a good product out there and doing what you need to do, people are going to want to come play. And then that whole, there's an accountability piece there too. Um, people aren't going to want to play for you if you're having a toxic environment. You're not doing what's right on, by the players. You're not doing well. You know, there's yeah. an accountability piece to it too. Yeah, I'm, I, I tend to be very pro player yeah. when it comes to these things and their free agency to make decisions over their lives. And yeah. I think what's hard for probably my listeners, and I think a lot of people even, you know, uh, writ large for the sport of soccer in the United States to understand is that it's pretty unique. The yeah. NWSL draft, as an example, or the MLS draft, for, for, as an example, compared to, say, um, what most Americans experience when we see the NBA and draft yeah, or yes. the NFL draft. Yeah. So what I don't think people understand as much is that the example of, like, my friend Sydney, yep. she got signed by yes. Racing Louisville, moved there. They have the rights to her as a player, and it's Kentucky. And here she finds herself, goes through training, thinks she's doing okay, doesn't get a contract. Yep. So it doesn't guarantee. Are. Yeah, that's the that's why people don't think understand is you There's look no at guarantee. NFL or NBA, you get drafted, 
you get a contract. Here, it's you get into camp and you still have to make the team. Yeah. So now they just basically have your rights. Yeah. And it's like, and there was no voice. Mm -hmm. And so that's the frustrating well, part. And you're left to scramble. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then as you mentioned, you're look, a lot of these young players are going, okay, I guess I'll look overseas. Yeah, exactly. Now and I some move. of those environments <laughs> yeah. are horrible. Yes, yeah. So, okay. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a, a fun slash challenging one. Okay. Women in coaching opportunities. Okay. Okay. I did some research on this and I was like, there's been some progress, yes. long way to go. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about NCAA women's division one sports. Yes. Okay. In the last 10 years, there's a positive trajectory. Yep. I think it was like 35% of NCAA division one women's sports coaches were women. Yes. It went from like 35 to now last year was 40, up to 46. Yes. I actually did a paper on this, but now I got to remember my. You know. I, I just read this this <laughs> yeah, whole this a, whole essay. Yes. Yeah, not an essay. It's a it's a. You're right. It's like no. A, they have a. They it's like a white this, paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. And um, a, a report. <laughs> yes, they put um, out those statistics. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I was like, I'm getting, <laughs> getting an education because I had all kinds of assumptions I could have made, and I would have been wrong. Yeah. Distinction needs to be made though. Sixty three percent of NCAA Division One women's basketball coaches are women. All right. If so, tells me quick math. I don't. I didn't find the number on soccer, but yes. I, that it's obviously dragging that number down. Yes, I was going to say. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> meanwhile, twenty-one percent of NWSL coaches are women. Three mm -hmm. coaches out of fourteen currently. Three of the first seven. Okay, I brought. I brought receipts. Pauline McDonald, <laughs> Denise Schulte Brown, and you, Coach Joe Johnson. Yes. If the fourth, if the final coach is um, for Brooklyn, yes. is announced as a woman, we'd have 50% right. straight up and down. That'd be fantastic. Meanwhile, 75% of WNBA teams are coached by women compared to, um, like I said, 21% of NWSL teams. So my question is like, is there a feedback loop? Like, where do you think the gap is? What's the missing piece for opportunities as well as hires when it comes to soccer specifically and women's women coaching, especially women, women soccer players and women teams? Yeah, I think you first have to have an organization that is open to bringing a female in um, and just even interviewing, right? Just having those opportunities to let people at the table. Um, and I think as the game is growing, it's grown so much from even when I was playing, like watching the Niner Niners as a youth player, even before that. So I think it's going to only continue to grow based off of <clears throat> just the growth of the game. Because mm -hmm. if it wasn't as big when I played, and now look at it here, and then a lot of the coaches that are coaching now, female coaches, were basically when I played. So there can only be, hopefully, if those opportunities are there. Um, but it is. I think there's. it's scary because you kind of get labeled that you're not experienced enough, or if you lead or you do certain things, you get labeled certain things, and there's family expectations. There's kind of a lot of different, it depends on who it is. There's a lot of different layers to it. Um, but there has been growth in that. I think the U.S., um, even with the coaching education, they've opened more doors and availability for females to be in the coaching education space, which will then help female coaches then get these opportunities because they've been they have the accreditation to, to be there. They've been female only coaching courses. They've been doing initiatives within even the NWSL or different colleges to get their grassroots licensing and kind of get them in the door to keep them in the game. Even U.S. soccer, um, Yolanda Thomas had an initiative and they did daycare at the soccer convention so that mom coaches could bring their kids because there wasn't anybody to watch the kids while they went to get continued education. So mm -hmm. I think just bringing more awareness of it, um, being able to fly with your children, you know, like you've got football coaches that can bring their whole family, yet you have soccer coaches that can't bring their kids. And so... Um, I don't know. I think it depends on what just breaking down those barriers and yep. keeping people. And I hope that we do a good job here and show that this is a space for us too. And that, um, it just opens doors and then females watching us on TV will be like, Hey, they look like me. I can do that too. Um, and so I think just, this is another opportunity, not only to help grow the game for the players, but also to grow coaching opportunities for females. And so I don't take that lightly coming into this yeah. is if I do what's right by the players, by the organization, by the league, by the game, then now it's a space for other female coaches to come into it and say, hey, she could do it. And then Denise and um, Pauline, and we can just set that tone too for the future. But 
I love that we're at 50% already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if Brooklyn makes it. Yes, a, yes, a, yes, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yes. But even 42%. 42, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's growing. But Yeah, I mean, I think when these organizations, and I wish this was happening at all of them, yeah. and of course, uh, college institutions, college and u- colleges and universities, of going, success in terms of wins and losses can't be the only outcome that matters to us when right. it comes to representation and coaching. Yeah. Because if you if that is how you define it, you get stuck in this feedback loop that right. I was describing. Yes. Of, well, yeah. we'll just keep continue hiring these experienced men right. over and over and over again right. because we're so afraid of not getting the wins and losses to line up. Yes. Well, representation matters. Yeah, Pat Summit. I mean, look at her. She was hired without any, and then it yeah, took exactly. her. She wasn't successful in the beginning, but then it took off. And so there needs to be not only the opportunity, but a little bit of patience. patience and yep. um, I feel like sometimes they make the female higher yet don't put the support around it. And then like you said, well, then we'll just bring somebody else in who's done this before instead of really supporting that um, and coming into the right. So like for me, I just felt so supported with Katie and Ryan and just knew from the get just conversations with them, Josh, Garrett, everybody, that this is a place that um, the players can thrive in, we can thrive in, the city can thrive in, the game can thrive in. And so I felt like blessed that I got put into this situation as my first pro um, environment because I know a lot of people have had to break in with a mm-hmm. less support and it's a lot harder. <laughs> and that support angle yeah. that, that you're mentioning is like so critical to this, yes. Joe, because I mean, I was just listening recently to um, Abby Wambach's podcast, yeah. We Can Do Hard Things. Yeah. And the topic was the disparity in both cognitive and physical load with households. Yes. Between men and women. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Do you know, are yeah. you familiar with it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And that support, if it's not there, it doesn't recognize that women in households tend to carry so much more of both physical and cognitive load as caretakers. Yes, no, I agree. Like, even when you're done with practice, you got to figure out what we're having for dinner. And not to say I don't, you know, I love that. I love being a mom. I love, but there is that load where you're constantly, I got to get parent-teacher conferences. I got to do those things. So that's just, you know, the natural that's how our culture is in the United States. Um, and so just being mindful of that through the process of as female coaches are obviously like the landscape of this space um, Mm -hmm. and figuring out what that looks like for moms, for coaches and the balance of mental health and grinding and working 15 hour days when you might be there 15 hours, but you're still stressed that you're missing your kid's birthday. That cognitive load, like you're saying is a little bit different um, just with the role of the females in the household. And so, Just having people that understand that and are supportive and are there that can help find pediatricians when you move here. Like Kate, you know, like all those different things. It's been so nice here, but hopefully other people will do that for female coaches in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I I, and honestly, to be very candid, I listened to that episode of that podcast. (laughs) My wife and I both did. And then we talked about (laughs) it. And I was like, yeah, I Got a long way to go yeah. as far as meeting my wife on either front, cognitive or physical load in our household. Yeah. So. Well, my husband's been feeling it. Bless him. He's been amazing and okay. supportive and has been the one that's really been behind me to let me take on this opportunity. And so he's had the kids for the month. So <laughs> he's, yeah, he's a blessing. But we're both coaches, so we both feel it. <laughs> okay. Let's talk local soccer. Okay. You mentioned... That you still follow the college game yes. and that you like it, yes. right? Okay. I started the Spokane Soccer Show. I am new to following the women's game at the level that I am currently. Okay. Um, and frankly, it started with me moving to Spokane and then having these opportunities to watch to, for soccer being in my backyard, right? right? And I went to a Gonzaga women's soccer game once upon a time and just completely fell in love with that team and what they were doing. They had this historic run. What have you been? What is your impression of the local <laughs> soccer scene? I, I've I've heard tell that you're out watching some been. games. Yes, I went to the some w, Yes, I went to some WPSL games. I watched a couple club practices. We've had some youth different trialists through, and so um, and I've obviously followed Gonzaga. Gonzaga, I'm saying that. Dude, yeah, Gonzaga. I get it. <laughs> I'm I learning. I'm to, learning. Joe, before I moved here. <laughs> 
I married a Gonzaga graduate, okay. and I still okay. struggled even until okay. I moved here. I'm going to do saying. it on purpose to annoy them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been nice. To, I don't feel, I wouldn't say I have a full grasp on it, um, but there's definitely really good soccer in this area, even through Seattle. Boise has some good teams. You've got Oregon not too far. And so that Pacific Northwest is really loaded with talent. And so we can't wait to do kind of an environmental scan and just really have a pathway for players um, into the professional level to where they can experience it and see, hey, if I do this, there is a pathway for me too. It's not just I can go to college and then I start working. So um, it's been really nice to start those initial steps, meeting people, getting people in the doors, going out to games. Um, and then hopefully as we get our feet going, you know, and get grasp on things, we can then bridge that out and um, get out to more stuff uh, and follow more. But, yeah, it's been good so far. The our, polo grounds <laughs> I, <laughs> went out there. I haven't even been. <laughs> yeah. I feel so bad. But I'm going to just say, look, sorry, not sorry. I haven't watched a lot of the local college men's teams. Right. <laughs> I haven't got and my friends, Jesse and Mike. I'm sorry. I haven't gotten to see one of their games. Summer just got crazy. Yes. And I. I've, same thing happened with the Shadow W the Shadow WPSL team that happened with the Gonzaga women's team last fall. <laughs> they had this historic little yeah, campaign they and they were yes. incredible. Yes, yes. And then I didn't even figure this out until recently. And when we did the soccer <laughs> profiles, Abby and I, and we talked about you, Alyssa Bourgeois. I forgot that you played for this California Storm yeah, she team did. before so, you signed with Zephyr. And I'm assuming yeah. that's why she stopped playing with them because she got signed yes, by us. Yep, yep. And she came out. So yeah. she, uh, <laughs> she went out to the game. She I kind of feel bad for her that yeah. she missed out <laughs> know, on that, like, yes. a national championship there. Yes, fifth. she did. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, those teams were just so freaking good. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was interesting to me. I didn't know that you could even do this, but um, that Colorado team played with USL, or no, yeah, USL women's and the WPSL. Wait, say it again. Which college? Which the Colorado, Colorado Storm. Oh, California Storm. California Storm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's wild. They're in the yeah. WPSL and the W League. Yeah, I don't, I'm super I don't know how it works. I'm not gonna. No clue. I just was like, I just watched them play in the W League, and yeah. then the next weekend I was okay. here in town, so I went out. I watched them play on TV because I had a player who played on the Calif Colorado Storm team they played against. Anyways. Oh, there's a, there, so there is a Colorado yeah, as well? Yeah, that's where I got, yes. Oh. And so they played against each other. I had a player I knew, so I watched that one. And then the next week I'm here, and that same team is playing WPSL. I was like, wait a minute, are they the same? And it was, but I I don't understand can't. it either. Because <laughs> meanwhile, the WPSL is like the largest women's soccer league in the U.S. Yes. It's like 126 yeah, teams, I think. Yes. Did you get a chance to see, did you know that the Portland Thorns Academy team Got to play against Wrexham. Wrexham. Yeah, did you notice yes. that? Yeah, that was wild. I heard that. And yeah. I heard they crushed them by like six goals. Seven to Seven, zero, yeah. yeah and I, I felt kind of bad because what stuck out to me in that whole thing was so many people were sliding into the comments that watched the television show were like, what is this? You should have picked better teams to play against, et cetera. I'm like, dude, the WPSL teams, there are some killers. Yeah. Those are like next year's NWSL drafted players and they're going to be playing in the USL Super League. These are yes. really, really good players. Yeah. I just don't think people realize like Wales is a small country yeah. <laughs> and their team, which they're developing and they're investing in is like, it's it's got a ways to go. I'm actually, it was not surprising to me that Portland Thorns did that. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to, again, that's why we fight for media representation of sports because there's representation of Wrexham, which just because they get that exposure that automatically people think they're very good. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they're, you know, the WPSL or the W League or anything is not good. They just haven't had that representation to show that. And so that was just, I think, just a sign of, hey, we saw the label and we see Ryan Reynolds and we see yeah. this. So they automatically have to be good without yes. doing their homework because they got that yeah, what media it, representation. So. Exactly. And what it means yeah. to me is, I mean, I... I did the classic thing where I went out and started watching the Shadow WPSL team. And I was yeah. like, what are you doing, Spokane? Get out yeah. and watch these women play. They're yeah. incredible. <laughs> and, of course, a couple of them were playing on their, they play on Gonzaga's team. Right. But, um, and shout out our friend Amelia Warta, yeah. who played on the Portland Thorns team. Yeah. And she scored a goal against yeah, Rexham. That was really cool for her. Yeah. And, and Chelsea and Marissa from the Gonzaga guess, team. Yes. They got invited to that, but they just, yeah. they had an injuries, think, yeah. not mild knocks from, probably from going that was 102 yeah, was degrees yes, in that, that weekend. Yeah. That game that went to penalties against yes. California Storm. <laughs> yeah. I'm still mad about that game. <laughs> okay, I got to get off that topic. All right, 
When you imagine taking the pitch for the first time ever at one stadium. Oh, man. I got goosebumps right Joe now. Joe Johnson. About it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. With Spokane's FRFC. Yes. What, I mean, you must imagine that moment. You must picture it. What do, what do you look forward to most? Like, what do you see? Um, I think it's just getting the fans out there. I've seen so much support about, you know, there's flyers and, and things on the light poles when you go around and billboards. And yeah, billboards, yeah. I can't tell you how many places I've been where people know who I am. And um, and so the town's already done its research on the players, on us, and I just kind of feel this buzz as we get closer and closer. And so I just, I, I went to the men's velocity game this weekend. It was the first one I got to go to, and it was rocking and so i'm just excited to like have our girls walk out on that tunnel. oh you got to go to the charlotte game. yes yeah yep. and so walk out on the tunnel through the tunnel i mean you train out there but there's just a different feeling when it's under the lights the whole community is around um so i think that just that initial it's here this day's been circled we've been talking about it it's been a long process just to get the league going and so i think it's just like a culmination of all of it and yeah. so going to be high energy, going to be buzzing. And so i um, just excited. I think it's that first step across is going to be that best moment. And then hopefully after that, it's business as usual. And we've been already pushing them so hard in practice and training that um, we can just get after it in the game. And um, yeah. It win. must feel good to have a, a squad of 22 players, by the way. Yes. Yes. Are you stoked on that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and the depth of the players. I think it's a blessing for me to have that, but it's going to be some difficult decisions on who we're going to put out there and it may change. And we're still trying to figure everybody out with, you know, it's yes, you have seven weeks of a preseason, but you never know what it actually looks like until you hit opponents. And so things may change. Um, and you're getting yeah. ready to start your preseason. Have you even, has the team even scrimmaged yet? Yes. Oh, you have? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have. You don't have to tell me yeah. any of these <laughs> yes. details because the folks at the, the front office of yeah. USL Spokane knows I like to find out information. Yes. So you can yeah. tell me you can't answer any yeah. of this if I ask you questions. You, but you the hard answer, part but. is, is nobody knows anything about the opponents of this league yet. So yeah. that's a, it's cool. It's a problem to solve. But, but it's a blank canvas. Yeah. So you have a blank canvas that you think you may be good, but yeah. or you think, man, we're far off. And then so yep. it's kind of hard right now to gauge. Um, but yeah, they've been buzzing around in training. and Have they scrimmaged each other? Or have you gotten yeah, to scrimmage all, a different team? Both. Okay. I'll <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Uh, yeah. Um, but you're getting ready to do your preseason. You're going to go. Yeah, on the I road mean, we've for been it. training, but we yes. won't see Spokane. I'm going to break your heart right now. You're not going to get to see <laughs> this team until August 17th. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which is okay. Yeah, it's okay. You got to come out. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. So we've been obviously training for the last four weeks uh, in town, and then we're going to go off to Seattle. A um, little bit of team bonding. A little bit of. Yep. Getting out on the road, just getting away from here, um, train next week there, and then we'll get game match prep heading into Fort um, Lauderdale the week we come back. So, yeah, two more weeks. My friend Abby and I did these 22 profiles of all yes. these players. We had <laughs> such a blast. Yes. And we, we now can... Maybe I should have come and <laughs> we could have... It would have been fun. Yeah, probably look what at, I did. Look at some film a together. A month ago, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm sure you will... A lot of the things that we say will probably yeah. resonate. I looked like a FBI boy with... <laughs> yeah. How do they know each other? Totally. And the It's Always Sunny the dots. meme yes. with... Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but we definitely uh, relate to what will be challenging for you. Yes. I'll, just, I'll just leave it yes. at that. Yeah. We are going to do... I'll give you a sneak okay. preview. In our next podcast we do together, we're going to do a hypothetical first 11. Okay. And we're just going to fling some things at walls. Okay. And it's not going to be easy, though, yeah. for us. But yeah. Abby wanted me to ask you, how do you <laughs> expect Coach Joe Johnson to manage this quirky schedule, the travel load as the only team west of the Missis Mississippi in the USL Super Yeah, I think we definitely have to make sure we capitalize on teams coming to us um, because I think we're going to need to get points in that first part of the season when they're traveling to us because then we're going to be on the road for eight. Mm -hmm. So um, we can't leave any. Did you but, say for eight? Yeah. It's eight, isn't it? Yeah. Wow, so, so we're many. eight at home and then eight on the road. So there's a blessing, you know, there, on both and a curse where you get to go through those hard moments and learn each other and get through the first part of the season while you're at home. It's a little bit easier, but then that means you have the back end to all of the travel. Um, I think we're going to stay out. Don't quote me on this, but I think we're going to stay out there for the longer one. So we don't have to come back for okay. the time change. And so that might help on managing some of the travel. Um, so all that stuff's in the works and making sure that we protect the players and their load. Um, but yeah, it's 
definitely different. I've never been a part of where you have eight home and eight away. And so, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we definitely have to capitalize it, use it, um, use it to our advantage. And then hopefully by then we've kind of got our rhythm, we've got our processes, we've got um, so that when it's on the road, it's not as hard. Everyone's going to learn together, including yes, the league. Exactly. And, you know. But we're not going to use an excuse. That's what it is. And no. that's what we're about is just what's the challenge, what's in front of us, and we're going to attack it. Abby and Sydney and I, we kind of see this similarly when okay. it comes to the very direct transitional play of the NWSL. Yes. It's actually Physical. kind of, it, yes. it, you could paint a, a pretty, with a broad strokes, yes. a lot of American soccer, including the MLS, and yeah, including youth soccer. Results. It all yeah. starts from the club. It does. <laughs> and it's it starts with youth players, and yeah. we just really reward uh, athleticism yes. and power and speed. And wins. Yep, exactly. And we do that at the youth level by having yep. the biggest, fastest January through March or June birthdays. Yep. yep. Oh, right. Yes. That too. So <laughs> yeah. your perspective about the type of um, play that you hope to see in the USL Super League from not just Zephyr FC, but from other clubs. Yeah, I honestly hope that the USL plays a little bit more and less direct because a lot of the players can play. And because they want to play and are more technical, maybe didn't get into that NWSL team because they weren't just direct mm -hmm. and so i think that there probably will be a correlation of players that are in our league um because of that that they don't want to play direct they don't want to play transitional they got looked over because they didn't just do that and so they still want to play professional they're very good you still get results that way mm -hmm. but within a different game model you're almost set up for failure if you like to play going into one league so i'm hoping i'm hoping and hopeful that this will be a little bit more of the soccer i appreciate not that there's no appreciation for the other one, but <laughs> yeah, time okay. play, yeah. Spokane Soccer Show listeners will love to hear that. Okay, <laughs> we we don't we don't want to see direct no, play. No, no, we, we want to see proper football. This proper soccer. Will not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I love it. Speed round. Are okay. you ready for this? Yes. Okay. Favorite memory as a soccer player? Ooh. Could Ooh. be a goal. Could yeah, I would be... say winning state championship in high school was fun. Ooh. Yes. Just representing your peers, like they didn't really know club soccer, but they knew your high school rivals and stuff. And so it was really cool to have your peers around you and representing your community. High school state championship. Yes. 2006. Ironwood Eagles. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Shout out if you know, yeah. you know, if you're out there. Um, favorite, favorite moment as a soccer coach. Oh, gosh. There's so many of those. Okay. Come on. This is going to sound cheesy, which I don't. Does it have to be like nope, a. No, it could be anything. Could be a conversation that you had with a player. Okay, so I, yeah, I just think when it clicks with a player, mm -hmm. like when you see that's difficult for them and you let them fail and you let them, pers like obviously in love, um, but when it clicks and then they look at you like, thank you for walking through that with me, like that's why I do it, you know? When it Does clicks a specific that, example come to mind? There's one at Tulsa when we were trying to, we just took over the program, they won two games, we're on the road at Houston, we won three nothing, we ran them off the park, weren't supposed to win that game, you know, they're going into the uh, Big 12, mm -hmm. and it was just like, it clicked, you know, it took us into the middle of that first season. Um, obviously, there's ups and downs, and why are we doing this? Why are you asking us this? And then when it was just clicking, and then it was just euphoria type of thing, and so getting with Emily Brandenburg, who was the captain at the time, it was just like hugs, and it was thank you for taking over this team, not just gutting the roster and bringing in different people, but developing them um, and showing that, hey, they're still good. Like just, you know, with Transfer Portal, you could come in and ax the whole team. Yeah. But working through that um, with what we had and then putting together a style of play and then getting those wins was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Favorite memory as a soccer fan? Oh, boy. Like watching the game. Oh, my gosh. That was easy. Okay. I, like, honestly, was... You know, when you're a little kid, you like to camp inside your house in the summer. Maybe mm -hmm. it was me. So I had a fort and like those giant, not giant TVs. They were 200 pound little TV because they were like a box. Yeah, the CRTs. Yep. Yeah. So put it inside the little my little fort and I was watching them play and everyone else was running around. I have five. I'm one of five. So brothers and sisters and friends. I'm in my little tent. You're going to have to describe what team you're talking about. For, oh, for yeah. Sorry. The U.S. national team winning. Um and PKs in the 99 World Cup and Brandy Chastain, you yeah. know, all the celebrations. And I think that was like, yes, this is what I meant to do. <laughs> okay. This is a controversial question. Okay. Um, Luis Hill, 
I hope you listen to this. <laughs> the greatest player of all time, man or woman. Ooh. Or do both. Pick one, one, one each. Okay. The classic debate. Uh, that depends. Like, I like Mia, I'm, Mia Hamm would be mine. Okay. The GOAT just for what she did. But I love Michelle Akers because that was my position. That's how oh, I like to play. Yeah. Just that hard-nosed disruptor. Still could build. Um, ooh. Grace of Messi. I think I'm going to have to go with Messi. Okay. Um, <laughs> love the Mia Hamm shout. Uh, that would probably be mine too, I think. Yes. Um, just the what she represented <laughs> in growing the game. That whole team, I mean, you can't just put it all on her, but the grace that she did with it um, and just being that face and that whole group is pretty awesome. I keep saying this to Abby and Sydney that if she continues this on this trajectory, I don't think Bone Mati is like oh, becoming, yeah. <laughs> she is, she's with yes. every achievement, it's like, yeah. If yes. they win the Olympics, uh, yeah. Anyway, Steven Gerrard, though, he was my he was my crush growing up. He was okay. everyone. I was joking with the girls today. All of my friends were watching In Sync and Backstreet Boys, and I'm Fox Soccer Channel watching Steven Gerrard hitting the half volley on the 18. Oh my goodness! I was like fangirl. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. you and Coach Veedman will yeah. <laughs> love to talk <laughs> yes. about Steven Gerrard, yeah. the alpha and the omega of yeah. box to box midfielders. Yes. By the way, <laughs> yes. that question when uh, I was asked by Eliza um, about. The box to box, I was like, just Stephen Dry, yeah, the, just, great, the greatest yeah. box to box midfielder yeah. of all time. Congratulations, yes, Coach Joe thank Johnson. You, you thank made you. it through my crucible. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Spokane Soccer thank Show. You. Thank you for coming on yes, the Spokane Soccer thanks Show. Me. Thanks for all you're doing for the community and growing the sport. We oh, stop it. it. This yeah, is no, I am <laughs> I this is a this is a privilege and a joy. The 509 Syndicate, City of Spokane, myself, every listener is fully behind you yeah. and we're so excited let's go see um, you uh, august 17th yes we are 100 percent behind you can't wait to see zephyr fc play at one stadium coach joe johnson i hope you'll join me again yeah like let's get a couple of results behind us yeah and we'll bring a player well, one player okay I keep, I have got to stop setting the degree of, <laughs> the degree of yeah. difficulty. The yeah. first podcast I ever recorded with my friend Jay was Coach Chris Watkins and two players from Gonzaga's team. Right. And I was like, what was I thinking? And then I go do this thing at Flatstick with, <laughs> oh, let's get Coach Feedman, but let's get Derek, let's get Andre, let's get Luis. I got to keep this simple. Yes, so setting yourself up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, once again, congratulations yeah, on this role. Thank and you. we're so excited. And thank you again for coming on the Spokane Soccer Show. Appreciate Until you. next time. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs>